purpose of this lesson is to learn what an array is, how to use arrays in VBA, the difference between a single and multi-dimensional array, how to propagate to and read data from an array, how arrays are passed from one method to another, how to use class modules, how to trap events, how to use objects and collections, and also to learn what user-defined types are. As we discussed in a prior lesson, a variable is nothing more than a named space in memory that can hold a value. And a variable can only hold one value. However, we do have a special type of variable called an array that is able to hold more than one value. Each value is going to be referred to as an element. The values are going to be referenced by the name of the array and then also an index number. And the index number is going to start at zero. That's going to be our first element in our array. So what we're going to do is we're going to name the array. So in this case, we already have an array called my array, And it's zero index. So the first location is set to 25. And then we have my array again. So the same name of the array element one so the second location is going to be set to 34 and then my array index two so the third memory location is going to be set equal to 12. so even though we we go zero one two there are still three elements in our array every array has a length and the length is just simply the number of elements that are contained in the array by default, the highest index number of every array is going to be whatever the length of the array is, minus 1. So in this array that we declared in the prior slide, you'll notice that we go from index numbers one, uh, excuse me, 0, 1, and 2. Well, the reason that we end up with 2 is because the length of the array is 3. There's three elements, but we subtract 1, and then we get our 2. So we'll see here that the length of the array, which is 3, minus 1 is going to be equal to 2. Now that's important because we need to keep track of if we have 10 elements in our array, then the highest index number is going to be 9. If we try to go beyond the number of elements that our array actually has, we will get a subscript out of range error message. Like all other variables, our arrays must be declared. When we declare a variable, we also must declare our, our data type. Now the data type is going to be declared, but if we don't actually specify what it is, just like other variables, it can be declared as a variant. So the way that we declare this is by simply dimensioning it, just like we do a variable, and then we give it a name, and then in parentheses we specify how many elements it should have. And this is important because our arrays, we always have to tell it how many dimensions there are, I'm sorry, how many elements there are when we dimension it. So in this case, we're declaring an array called my array, and we're telling the system that there are five elements. Now, I did not specify what the data type is, so therefore the data type is variant. And since there are five elements, that means that our first index number is zero, and then our highest index is going to be four. Now, we can also specify our arrays like this. So we're going to dimension array called my array. And we're going to specify that our elements are going to be numbered 1 to 10. Now what this does is this forces the first element's index to be 1 instead of 0. And then we also specify that this is as a string. So what this did is this declares an array that has 10 elements in it. The data type is string. The first element's index is 1 and the highest element's index is 10. So now what we can do is we can reference our array as my array 1 all the way up through my array 10. Another way to change the first index number is to use what's called an option base 1. And what this does, this command allows us to start at 1 instead of 0. And what we do is we just simply state option base 1, that's the actual command. And then what that did is it just told it that when we create an array, the array is going to start at index 1. So in this case, I dimensioned an array called my array with two elements. And then because I use the option base one, it means our first index is one and our last index is two. Now this does make it a little bit easier when we're dealing with things like the length of our array because that would make the number of elements in the array equal to the highest index number for our array. 
Arrays are a lot easier if you can think of them like a matrix. And what I mean by that is think of it as a two-dimensional table. So just like in Excel, we have columns and we have rows. So I, the array that I declared before was a one-dimensional array. So that'd be just like having our A column and then all of our rows, and then however many elements we have would be our individual rows. We can also have what are called multi-dimensional arrays, and these can be thought of like a matrix, which, like I said, is similar to a two-dimensional table. Each value is going to be referenced by a row and a column. Now, they're not technically rows and columns, but when we, when we visualize them, it makes it easier to try to picture it that way. All right, so what I want to do here is I wanted to mention an array called my array that has uh, 10 rows and then it has two columns. So just like in our R1, C1 format, we do rows first. So what we're going to have here is our rows are going to be numbered 1 through 10 and then our columns are going to be numbered 1 through 2. So what that means is we're actually going to have 20 elements in our array. We'll have 10 per column, 2 columns, so 20 elements. All right, so this array has 10 elements per column, two sub-elements, so therefore 20 total elements in it. All right, so if I want to reference the fifth column, second, I'm sorry, fifth row, second column, what I can do is I can say my array 5, 2, and we're going to set that equal to 25. So what that does is that sets the, the value for the fifth row's second column to 25. In the prior examples that I showed to you, I hard-coded the values for the actual index element values. That's not necessarily recommended. We can hard-code them into the program, but in reality, what we want to do is we want to read the data from a worksheet. So what we're going to do is we're going to declare one-dimensional and two-dimensional arrays by reading values in from a range. So a one-dimensional array is going to be read from a range consisting of one column. And so the way that we do this is we just simply dimension the array. So in this case, I dimensioned an array called my1d for one dimension array. It has 10 elements in it. And then I set that array equal to worksheets and then whatever sheet it's on dot range and then the column from which we need to pull the data. So now notice in this case, I went from A1 to A10, but if, if the A column has a header in it, I may get, need to go from A2 to A11. Our two-dimensional array is going to be similar, so we dimension it as a name. So here I called it my 2D array, and I declared that it is 10 rows tall and three columns wide, so that would mean columns A, B, and C, or whatever three columns I want to use. So in this case, what we do is we take my 2D array and set it equal to worksheets, sheet 1, so whichever sheet we're reading the data from, dot range, and then the range that consists of those three columns and 10 rows. I've created a new Excel workbook that has a list of students and the grades those students received. And so the grades over here, you'll notice, are in the B column. They go from B2 all the way through B11, which means I have 10 grades. So what I want to do is I want to create an array to hold these values. So what I'm going to do is I created a new module, and we're going to go ahead and create a new subroutine, and then we're going to create an array from the values that are contained in that spreadsheet. My new sub is going to be called sub, and then we'll call it grade array calc. And what I want to do in here is I need some variables and arrays. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment my code here. So we're going to declare variables. And then the next thing we need to do is we're going to populate the array. Now we're going to populate the array from the column that is in the table that has our grades in it. All right, so then what I want to do is after I populate the array, then I want to write out some values to the, uh, to the user. So let's do like a message box. We're going to display things like uh, the maximum or the average score. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to dimension our variable, I'm sorry, our array here. So I'm going to say dim, and then I'm going to give it a name. We're going to call it grade array. 
and I'm going to let it be a variant. And the reason for making it a variant is going to be that if the user puts in something that looks like an integer, it will automatically treat it like an integer. If they put it in as a double, so maybe they allow 67.6, uh, so they allow fractions of a, of a percent, then we can account for that also. All right, so we have our array here, so we need to populate the array. And the way that we're going to do this is, excuse me, we're going to read through the data that's contained in the range on the worksheet. So we're going to set grade array equal to, and then worksheets, what is the name of the sheet? So sheet one, dot, and then whatever the range is, well, the range here is B2 to B11, and then dot value. So whatever the value is for that particular range, we're going to take that entire range and load it into our array. Now the catch to this is, it's automatically going to just grab all of this, stick it into this array for us, and we don't need a loop to read that data into our array. I want to get the average score for all of these grades, so I'm going to make a new variable here to hold that. So we're going to dimension one. And the average is probably going to end up being a fraction, so we're going to make it a double. And just for sake of naming convention, I'm going to call it DBL grade and then average. And we'll declare it as a double. So that way they can have a fraction in here. All right, so before we can display the average score, we need to do some calculations. So we're going to calculate. Calculate the average score. All right, so to calculate the average score, what we need to do is we need to read through the array and figure out what the average is. Well, luckily, we can use all of our worksheet functions that are built in, and I can set DBL grade average equal to worksheet function dot average, and then what do I want to average? Well, I want to average grade array. And what this does is it allows the system to automatically pull in the entire array and then just simply figure out what the average is from there. And then what we can do is we can display a message box. And then in the message box, we can say something like average score is and DBL grade average. So what we're doing is we're just simply taking the entire array we are populating the array from the values that are contained in our workbook in these locations, B2 to B11. And then we populate it by the values. Then we look at the entire array. We pass it over to this work worksheet function dot average and let it figure out what the average is. And then it will put that average into DBL grade average. And then we display to the user what the average is. So if I were to run this program, it's going to pop up with a message box to tell us what the average is. All right, so we're going to go ahead and run this. And then it pops up. The average score is 81.5. So what that does for us is I didn't have to use a loop. I didn't have to do a for next or anything else like that. We just simply allow the system to take all of these grades that are somehow related, dump them into an array, and then we take that entire array and pass it over to some other function to figure out the averages. It's a lot easier than trying to use our loops to get the same information. We're going to keep adding to that prior example by being able to figure out things like the max grade and then the minimum grade and then displaying to the user what the max, min, and average are. So what I've done here in this one is that we dimension these other variables as doubles, just like we did the, um, the average. And then we just simply pass those over to those functions. You'll notice we have different functions that we can play with. Now, one thing to keep in mind is I want to have line breaks here. So I want each of these to show up on a separate line. And what VBA allows us to do is a carriage return through a special character called VBCR. So what we're going to do is we're going to reproduce this to be able to get the maximum and the minimum values. All right, so I'm going to modify this a little bit. We're going to dimension DBL grade max as an average, as a double. And then we're going to dimension DBL grade min as a double. And then what I want to do is I want to figure out what those values are. So just like I did with the 
uh, average, or figure out, we're going to figure out the max, and then the same way. So I'm going to say DBL grade max equal to worksheet function dot, and then I have max, and then we're going to pass the entire array to this function again. We're going to set DBL grade min equal to worksheet function dot min, and once again, we're going to pass the entire grade array. And then what that allows us to do is pass this over and it automatically calculates it. No loops, none whatsoever. If I were to do this manually, I would have to have a for loop to read all the data in from all of the locations over here. So every one of these cells I'd have to read in. I would have to store them all in variables. So that way we can keep track of, of what they all had as a value. And then what we would have to do is add those all together, figure out how many things we have, divide by that to get the average. We don't need to do that. We're going to let these functions automatically do it. And all we have to do is just simply dump this all into one array, pass the whole array over to that function, and let it do it for us. A lot shorter program. All right, so what I want to do is I'm going to change this just a little bit. I'm going to say average like this. And we're going to say average and DBL grade average, and that will display that. And I want our VB carriage return. And I want to then say something like max. And then I want our uh, DBL grade max. And I want another carriage return, so VB carriage return. And, and then our minimum value and DBL grade min. So it gets kind of long, but it allows us to go through and figure out what all these values are and then pass them back. And the nice thing is because we can use carriage returns, we can put this all right in one, uh, one message box. All right, so let's go ahead and run it. And there you go. So now it figures out the average for us, figures out the max and the minimum. And by looking at the values over there, you can see that the minimum is a 56 and the max is a 98. I don't need to do anything special to calculate this. We let that other function do it for us. Just like we populated the array, we can also read data back from the array and write it out to the workbook. So what I want to do is I want to create another column that figures out what the difference is from the average for each of these scores for these students. So the system is going to automatically calculate the average for me. And then when it calculates the average, then it will display what the difference is for each of those, um, each of those values. Now, this is going to function a little bit differently. Uh, when we created the array, we just simply read the whole range in. In this case, because I want to actually perform a calculation, I do need to have a loop. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to dimension i. This is our counter, just like before. We're going to start it at 1 because uh, when we use this range as a variant like this, it will actually create the first element as index 1. So for each grade that we have in grade array, so we're just simply calling each element grade, we're going to look at cells 1, 3. So this is row 1, column 3. So that would be right here where it says difference from average. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at an offset. So we're going to allow our counter, i, to tell us what the offset is and just simply keep going down a row. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set it to be whatever the grade array i comma 1 is. Now notice I do have to specify this because when I created the array, it allowed it to, to dimension it the way that it wanted. And it, whenever it dimensions it that way, it will automatically make it a two-dimensional array. So I do have to specify that it's the first element on the ith row. And then we're going to subtract the grade average. Then after we do that, we increment our counter by 1 and do the next grade, and we let it keep going through and doing this, and it will provide all of the values in this distance, I'm sorry, difference from average column. All right, so I've created my difference from average column, and I want to start writing values in here as to what the difference is from whatever the student actually earned to the average score. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, write difference from average to the worksheet. All right, so we're just simply giving ourselves notes as to what these sections of code are responsible for doing. We need our counter, so I'm going to dimension i as an integer. 
And then we're going to set i is equal to 1. So that way it starts our counter at 1. All right, then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to do our for each loop. So for each grade that exists in the grade array, and then what we're going to do is we're going to look at cells 1, 3, because this is going to be where it actually says difference from average right here. And what I want to do is I want to use an offset. So our offset is going to go down in rows. So what I want to do is cells 1, 3 dot offset, and then our offset is going to be um, going to be i. Now, really, what I could do is I could say i comma zero, like this. But if I'm only dealing with the rows, remember it's rows comma columns. I can leave off the zero here, and it will just treat it like our our rows. Now, if I did want columns, remember I can put a comma here, and that would do our com columns. All right, so I'm going to say cells one comma three offset i which I starts at 1, so that immediately means that it bumps down one row, so now we're on row 2. And then the dot value, we're going to set that equal to whatever the grade array is, and the index that we're looking at is i, that's the, the row, comma 1. Remember, I, I allowed the grade array to automatically be self-dimensioned up here, so it did create it as a two-dimensional array. And then we're going to subtract whatever the average score is, so DBL grade average. We do need to increment our counter, so we're going to say i is equal i plus 1, and then we're going to do our next grade. So we're going to allow it to loop through there. Alright, so what we're doing is we have a counter, we're going to allow the system to look at each of the grades that exist in the grade array, so I don't have to worry about the length of the array or anything like that, we're going to let the system do it on its own because the for each has that built into it. We're going to look at cells, row 1, column 3, so where it says difference from average, dot offset, in this case the first one's going to be in 1, so it's actually going to be one column down from there, so row 2, dot value, is equal to grade array 1, comma 1, so the first row, comma, first column, minus DBL grade average, increment or counter, and then that's it. Alright, so let's go ahead and run this. Tells us what our average is, our maximum, and our minimum, and then it writes those values out. So now what we can see is that this score is negative 14.5. So the question is, what exactly does that mean? And the negative is that the 67.5 is less than the average. And then this one is more than the average. But we can go a little bit more, and what we could do is we could have an if statement in here that will actually state that if it's uh, higher than the average, then we can color it green, and if it's less than the average, we can color it red. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to my statement here. Now, we've already told it what the value is for each of these, but what we want to do is we actually want to, before we increment the counter, have our for loop. Okay, so we're going to say for, sorry, not for, if, um, if grade array i comma 1 is greater than DBL grade average, then we want to color it. Sorry, then we want to color it something. Okay, then if we color it, we're going to color it green, and then if we color that one green, then if it's not greater than, we want to color it red. All right, so we're going to look at the same location, so cells, and then 1, 3, dot offset i, dot color is going to be equal to RGB. And then remember, RGB values are going to be red, green, and blue. So if I'm looking for uh, green, all I have to do is turn off red, turn on all of the green, and then turn off the blue. Okay, so then if it's not greater, so then else, we're going to say cells, 1, 3, dot offset i dot color is equal to RGB and then we want this to be red so 255 0 0 and then end if. Alright so what we're doing here is we're just simply stating that if the value is greater than the average you're going to color green otherwise we're going to color red. And one thing I forgot to specify in here is that I do have to state that it is the font color so we're going to change this to font.
color. And then now if I run this, it will allow us to go through, calculate the average, minimum, maximum, and then also do our difference and color it. So we get our average, max, and min. It calculates it, and then it changes the color. So we can easily look at this and see that, okay, this one's red. That means this student earned a lower score than the average. So it just gives us a visual way to see who earned higher or lower score than our average score. I mentioned earlier that an array has to be dimensioned to a specific size. The problem is, is if I need to add things to an array and I don't have any extra elements, I can't just simply add new values to it. It won't allow me to do it. I go out outside of the bounds of the array and I get a subscript out of range error. So what we have to do is we have to redimension the array to whatever the new size is. And what this does is it allows our arrays to be dynamic. One thing to be aware of is when we resize an array, what it actually does is it makes a duplicate copy of our array to a new memory location that has a bigger size. So there are two ways that we can do this. All right, so in this example, I have an array called score array. It was originally declared as an array length of five, but we need to add an additional element. So we need it to be a length of six. All right, so if you think about it in terms of taking our existing array and copying it to a new memory location with a bigger size array, the two ways that we can do it is we can redimension it by using the redim command, type the name of the array, and then whatever size we need it to be. Now, if I were to do it this way, we are redimensioning it, and we're just simply making a new memory location that has six uh, elements, or six places to put values, and the values of those uh, elements are going to be equal to zero because that's our default value for an array. So what this actually does is it causes us to make it a duplicate of our array as a bigger size, but all of the values are empty. So we actually end up deleting all the existing data. If we want to keep our existing data, then we need to use the preserve keyword. So we redim preserve score array six. It makes a new memory location that has six elements for us. It copies the existing array to that new location. It keeps all the existing data and makes the array one size larger. We talked about events already, and we talked about how we have these things called event handlers that wait for some sort of thing to happen. They're waiting for a trigger in the background. What happens is there are events that are already built into the system, things like clicking the mouse or right-clicking and printing and saving and so forth. And we talked in the last lesson about being able to do things like look at something before the user right-clicks and look at something before the user saves and so forth. Well, what if it's an event that occurs from something outside of Excel? So what we can actually do inside is we can actually trap events from other applications. And when we trap these events from the other applications, the event occurs, the operating system understands that it happens, and if that application supports the trapping of events, then VBE or VBA will allow us to, to trap that event and do something with it. The handler does have to be installed along with the application, so it has to be a program that supports it. Most of the Office applications actually support traps. An example of when this would be helpful would be, let's say we email a workbook to somebody and then they open up the workbook directly from Outlook. Well, what we can do is when they open it up, we can actually do things like see who they are, get their email address, possibly their name, and we can pull that information right out of, it, out of Outlook into our Excel workbook and keep track of who actually opened it. We talked about application level events. And the application level events are going to be things like where you open up Excel and then you open a workbook or make a new workbook or something like that. What we can do is we can create new class modules that will trap that kind of information and then that will allow us to build custom objects to create tasks that can occur. This is similar to building events. So like in um, our application, we have application.workbookopen. We can make new events that occur at the application level by making custom objects. An object is a container that contains related items. And if you think of an object as an index card, it makes it easy to visualize it. So I have an index card for every student that we have at a particular school. 
So what I'm going to do is on each index card, I will write something like the student ID number. And then every index card that we create is going to have the same fields on it. It's going to have something like a student ID number. It'll have their name, address, telephone number, and email address. And every single index card has that same information on it. And so what we're going to do is we have a new student that comes in. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull out a new index card. And that new index card immediately we write the fields, um, ID, name, address, telephone number, email, and then we fill in those values. Okay, so the actual field name of ID is what's called an attribute, and then the attribute is going to have some sort of value. So ID is the attribute, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 would be the student ID number, that's the value for that attribute. Um, something like student name, that would be the attribute. Jane Doe would be the value that goes in that attribute. So, like I said, if you visualize an index card, it makes these objects a lot easier to understand. Now, we can reference an object with dotted notation. So, what that means is that if I have a student whose student ID number is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and that's how I actually reference that student, I can look at student, um, I'm sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 dot name and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, dot, address, and so forth. It allows us to very easily figure out these other attributes based off of some sort of key field. Keeping with the example of this particular student, I have an object name, which is student, and then it has attributes such as ID, name, address, telephone number, and email. So what I can do is I can reference this as student, dot, ID, and student, dot, name student dot address and so forth and if I can reference it as student dot whatever then I can use the with statement so the with statement says with statement use all of these other fields so what I can do is I can specify that the ID or dot ID is one two three four five six the dot name is Jane Doe the dot address is one two three first street the dot telephone is this and the dot email is this and then end with all right, so the question is, where did all of this come from? And all of this came from a class object that I created. To create a class object, you go into the VBE, you insert a new class object, and just simply rename it. Now, typically, we'll use uh, CLS and then some sort of name. CLS is the prefix we use for classes. So the name is going to be the object class. So in this case, I would do something like CLS student. And then we can declare properties for the class objects. And then we can also include any methods that are going to be used. Continuing with this example, what I did was I created a new class, uh, a class module called CLS Student. And then inside of it, I just simply created some public variables. Okay, so what these are are our attributes that we're going to allow every student to have. And then what I did is just made it public so that way anybody can access this information. And then what we do is we actually create a subroutine in a standard module. So notice it's just a regular module, module 2. And we dimension student as a new CLS student. So the question is, what is student? All right, so student is going to be this particular student's name. Now, the thing is, is we can only have one student. So we'll get to that in just a minute. But for this particular example, student has an ID number that we assign here has a name, has an address, telephone number, email address, and so forth. And what happens is it takes all of this stuff and stores it over here in these variable locations. And then what we can do is we can actually create a public function here. So we have a method called say hi, and it just simply pops up a message box and says hello, and then includes the name of the student. So the way that we call this, over here what we do is we do student which was the name of our class object, student dot say hi, that's the name of our method. And so now what we can do is we can do things like student dot enroll, student dot drop, student dot withdraw, and so forth, depending on what functions we actually have available to us. And then, so what happens when we run this, all of this stuff gets loaded. So imagine this all getting written down on an index card. And then when we do student dot say hi, it looks at the name on the index card and says hello and whatever their name is. Like I said, the, the object type can only hold one object at a time, which means we can only have one student. And that's not necessarily feasible. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to use what's called a collection to contain more than one object. So we can have a collection and allow us to have each student have a whole bunch of classes, or we could have a whole bunch of students. We just simply have to use collections, and then we can perform calculations on them. So as an example, we create an object to keep track of how many hours an employee worked. Well, we can only keep track of the last set of hours if we used an object. But if we use a collection, then what a collection is, uh, imagine we create a new index card every time the employee has a new set of hours. And then the collection is going to hold that card, and then that allows us to go back and look through all of the different cards that, that employee has and look at the values for their total payments, tax, liability, total work hours, and so forth. A lot of our existing objects actually have um, properties that are already assigned to them. They also have actions that are assigned to them. And what we can do is we can use what's called a user-defined type to be able to create additional properties for existing class objects type, object types. And then we can also modify properties for existing class object types. In this lesson, you learned what an array is, how to use arrays in VBA, the difference between a single and multi-dimensional array, you learn how to write data to and to read data from an array. You learn how arrays are passed from one method to another and how we can use those with worksheet functions. You learn about class modules, how to trap events. You learn how to use objects and collections and then also what user-defined types are.